Yes. May I then turn to um, the next item on the agenda this morning, item 7, which is the Consolidated Financial Report, and invite Paul to speak to this. Thank you, Malcolm. So, um, overall, as you can see from the report in front of you, the financial performance of the system is gradually converging towards delivery of the budgeted level of expenditure for the year. The forecast gap has been narrowing gradually from 184 million at month six to 42 million, as you can see in front of you, in the month eight numbers. And as I've pulled out in the report itself, our assessment of risks and opportunities at month eight reduces the gap further to 17 million. Um, so you can see the numbers for yourself. There are just three key points within that which I would draw to your attention. Uh, the first is about CCGs. So most CCGs, the vast majority, are managing to live within their allocations despite what is, uh, by all accounts, an exceptionally challenging year in the business. Uh, we do, however, have a small number of specific cases of CCGs getting into significant financial difficulties, concentrated in the Midlands and East and South regions particularly, where for reasons that we've discussed previously in this board, financial positions are in many cases a wee bit less robust. And those small number of cases account for about 100 million of adverse variances within the totals you can see there between them. I just thought you would want to have assurance that uh, robust recovery plans are either in place or being put in place for each of the CCGs with significant variances, that the Finance and Investment Committee, shortly to become the Investment Committee, uh, reviews each of those cases in some depth at its meeting and satisfies itself that the action that's been taken is appropriate and adequate. Uh, I've also, on top of that, just initiated a cross-cutting review of those particular cases to see if there are particular lessons that we can learn uh, in terms of our processes for assuring plans, detecting risks and <coughs> making effective interventions uh, through our local teams when that is uh, called for. And I think that will help us in real time with the assurance of the operating plans that we'll be doing over the next couple of months. And obviously I'll bring back to the board any particular conclusions from that which I think you would find helpful. Um, Fortunately, those negative variances I've just been describing are offset by some upsides, particularly in London, and by uh, lower levels of quality premium payments than we'd originally budgeted for, the financial benefit of which, of course, we'll see coming through in the remainder of the year, which is why it gets better between the year to date and the final position. So overall, as you can see, the CCG position is in broad balance in the forecast. And these underlying positions have, with few exceptions, stood the test of the deep dive, which I think I mentioned again at the last meeting that we had, that we've had around month nine positions. Uh, and so therefore we'll be going forward into the numbers that you'll see for the rest of the year. Uh, the second thing is on specialised commissioning. There is an overspend, as you can see in the report, of 155 million uh, forecast for the year. I'd point out that 100 million of that relates to the Cancer Drugs Fund, and you'll be aware that we've recently taken action on the Cancer Drugs Fund to better target it on those drugs with the best clinical and cost effectiveness. And while that's come too late to have much of an impact on this particular year, it will enable us to set a more robust budget for 1516 and then uh, hold to it. Uh, the remaining variance is less than half a percent of the budget on specialised, which does suggest to me at least that the measures that we've put in place recently to bring greater control in that area are beginning to work. I won't declare victory just yet, but they're beginning to have their impact. We do, however, just need to remind ourselves all the time that there is 400 million of non-recurrent drawdown supporting this year's position in specialised commissioning, which uh, clearly we won't have next year, and we need to bring that into recurrent balance uh, for 15-16. And finally, we've been reviewing uh, the expenditure on NHS England admin and central programme costs, partly in preparation for the budget setting for 15-16, which, as I've said before, will be particularly tight. This review has indicated quite a number of upsides, mainly, I have to say, from slippage in expenditure on central programmes. And again, that's reflected partly in the forecast you have there and partly in the slightly better position in the uh, risk-adjusted and mitigation-adjusted uh, numbers that I quoted at the beginning. So overall, despite all the many challenges of this year, we're getting very close to what I think will be a balanced position or better at the end of the year. And I currently expect to be able to report that the remaining gap has been closed when we meet in March, and I'll comment on that. Um, so you may or may not have questions on all of that. There's one other matter of some importance which I thought I would just 
uh, bring to the board's attention and update to you on, um, which isn't directly to do with 14-15 finances, but is very, very central to 15-16 finances and therefore perhaps worth commenting on. Uh, you may have been wondering what has happened about the tariff uh, since we last discussed it back in uh, December. Uh, and I can tell you that Monitor will shortly be announcing the results of their, con their consultation on the tariff, which, if you recall, had the particularly wonderful closing time of midnight, if I remember rightly, on Christmas Eve, which sent us all packing off for our holidays with uh, great joy. Um, they will report in that uh, in that in that. Uh, announcement later on uh, that while only a minority of providers and CCGs responded negatively to the consultation, the relevant response threshold by market share of providers was reached, which does mean that we can't immediately proceed with publishing the tariff as it was consulted upon. Now, since the overall NHS funding totals for 1516 are now finalised, agreed, any changes to the proposed tariff would in practice just be robbing Peter to pay Paul, to use a slightly unfortunate metaphor or, uh, or uh, expression for someone with my name. However, um, so robbing Peter to pay Paul in this instance means some gains for some providers, but inevitably less investment in other hospitals, <coughs> mental health and GP and community services. The exact opposite, if you like, of what we've been talking about in the forward view and that which our experience of the winter that we've just been discussing tells us we really need to be doing. So, if that's not much of an option, the alternative laid down under the Health and Social Care Act is that in these circumstances the Competition and Markets Authority should now be uh, asked to consider the issue. Uh, and you might then ask the question, well, what happens while all of that takes place? Because these things are not always uh, as swift as we might ideally want. Uh, while that happens, of course, the current tariff rolls forward. That's what the Act specifies in the event that we haven't put in place a new tariff at any point in time. Um, now, to ensure that NHS finance is balanced during this interim period before a new tariff takes effect, with in particular the efficiency adjustments which each year come with a new tariff, there may well need to be equivalent reductions to sequin or indeed other supplementary payments to balance the books while that is taking place. Uh, it also means that, in the meantime, the proposed increases to the emergency marginal rate, which has been something which uh, was in the proposals we put forward last year, uh, can't go forward until such time as we move forward with a new tariff. So uh, that's the state of play. Uh, Monitor and NHS England, of course, will update the sector in due course with more detail on next steps with any luck within the next <coughs> fortnight. In the meanwhile, of course, it's vitally important that that process of planning and contracting, which is taking place at the moment, continues uh, without being delayed by all of this. Uh, and CCGs and providers in this context should obviously assume that the 15-16 planning round proceeds on the agreed timetable as we set it out back in December, and critically within the funding and overall efficiency envelope set out in the joint planning guidance that we put out with Monitor and with the TDA just before the Christmas break. So uh, a complex set of situations. Uh, we've, I've given you, I hope, a sense as to how that will need to play itself out over the next couple of weeks, but uh, I thought it would be worth your while knowing that uh, at this point. Well, thank you, Paul, for bringing us up to speed on that. May I invite comments and questions from the board on your paper uh, and in addition on that of their wish? Moira. Just to understand, the biggest vo people's vote is weighted, the organisation's vote is weighted to size, and who will do better out of reverting to the earlier uh, model, the biggest providers? Well. Proportionately, the biggest would be specialised providers because, of course, we had planned as part of the set of measures we've taken to bring specialised commissioning under control a marginal rate for those providers. So if that doesn't go forward, of course, that will yes. distort the economics of specialised provision more than it will the rest of the <coughs> And could I just follow up, Mark? Presumably this adds a huge amount of uncertainty um, yeah. to everyone in the system. So, y yes, it does, but that's why I said what I said at the end, which is we've got to get on with the planning, and given all of the things that I set out in the beginning of my little update, the only basis on which we can sensibly plan is the set of measures that we put out jointly with the other ALBs concerned uh, just before the Christmas break. That is the set of numbers that we're asking people to continue to plan with while we sort out this consequence. 
Well, thank you, Paul, for updating us, and thank you for your report, which I think provides us with the assurance that we need. If the board is content with that, Ed, I assume there's nothing you want to add? Not from an audit uh, perspective, no. I, mean, I think that the last point that Paul has made is um, uh, ask some very serious yes. questions which we need to address for the future, because uh, that creates an environment where we can't deliver the very strategies that we uh, have set out based on where we believe the need is and um, there's some some stuff to address there but we all know that we, are, yes, we need to just understand better what are the mitigations that we can uh, bring back okay uh, thank you very much for that Paul <coughs> I'd like to move now to um, the report on transforming care and invite Jane to introduce it to us <coughs> thank you Jane so the board will recall that um, at the end of November, Sir Stephen Bubb um, published a report on transforming care. We commissioned Sir Stephen because, uh, to do that work because we were particularly concerned about the lack of progress that had been made across the system um, and by us in terms of delivering a reformed care for people with learning disability, in particular in dealing with um, uh, the previously agreed um, ambition that we would discharge patients um, from inpatient settings. So today we are across system publishing our response to the Stephen Bubb report and at the same time the Department of Health is also publishing uh, a two-year-on report in terms of progress and um, actions that have happened since the Winterbourne View Concordat was published. So what, I intend, what I'd like to do today is just take you through our response and describe some of the work that we're doing um, over the next few months uh, to really um, ramp up and improve um, the service that we are offering and providing to patients with learning disability. I think one of the most important things to, to say at the beginning is that uh, this is a whole system response. So this is NHS England, um, the Local Government Association, the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services, Care Quality Commission, Health Education England and the Department of Health. And that, um, that is a recognition from all of those key partners that actually this is a complex and um, a complex piece of work. The needs of people with learning disability, particularly those that, that are currently in inpatients, is, um, is wide, it's varied and complex. And we really need to work together to, uh, to make that difference. It's not enough for one organisation or one system to do that. Um, we are setting um, our ambition out, which is saying we are being very upfront that we want to see a substantial reduction in the number of people that are in inpatient settings. We want to reduce the length of stay for those that, are, that need to be in inpatients. And we want to improve the quality of care that people receive, both in the community and in inpatients, and particularly improve the quality of life of people with a learning disability. Um, when you talk to people with learning disability and their families, as, as I do um, on, a, on a regular basis, one of the things they, they talk about is, the, is a desire and a, um, a, a really strong desire to be uh, treated like everybody else, to have a right to choose where they live, to have a right to choose what treatment they have, to work, to be educated, um, and not to be, um, be marginalised or be done unto, which I think is what um, many people feel that they've done in the past. So our, our report, and our combined report, has got a number of work streams, and I'll go through some of those in a bit more detail. One of them is around empowering people and empowering families, making sure that we've got the right care in the right place, making sure that we're improving regulation and inspection, um, that we're improving the workforce so that they are, being, they are trained and educated and supported to provide the very best care, and ensuring that the right, we've got the right data and the right information. And as part of that, one of the first things um, that we've done is we've agreed some new governance arrangements. And on one level, people might say, well, you know, why not? We've had complex governance arrangements already. But what we are doing, and this is different, is we're implement we are about to start establish a transforming, transforming care delivery board. And the purpose of that is that we're concentrating with the senior responsible officers from all of the different organisations on delivery. This is not about getting together and talking, it's about making sure that we focus and deliver on our promises to people with learning disability and their families. Um, and that, um, that, that board will be chaired by NHS England um, and me, 
and will be and the vice chair will be um, from ADAS, and that's something we've agreed um, and uh, across across the system. And the paper that you've got will actually t talks about the different work streams that we'll be focusing on, and each of those work streams has got a signif a different identified lead organisation. But the principle about that is that we work together to deliver what what we want to do. So if I take you through some of the practical actions that we're taking. Um, Around empowering people and families, one of the things that uh, Stephen Bubb put into his report was a, a recommendation that there was a charter of rights. So what the Department of Health um, will be doing shortly is they're going to consult on a wide range of potential future measures and some of that may include legal changes um, around what people's rights, and rights are. Um, that should be um, published over in the next in the coming weeks, um, and will actually enable the Department of Health and partners to really consult on the, more widely um, with people with learning disabilities, families, carers, and other interested parties. But more immediately, um, Stephen talked about a right to challenge, and so. Many of you will know about the care and treatment reviews, and I'll come back to those in a moment. But in the meantime, what we're doing is we are saying that we, we will give people who are inpatients and their families the right to challenge an ongoing inpatient treatment. Um, they could be able to request those, and we will make sure that we provide that, we provide that response. At the same time, we are going to embed the care and treatment reviews that we've started over the last few months into normal, everyday business as usual. Those care and treatment reviews are based on reviews that the Improving Lives team set up. Um, when the Improving, and the Improving Lives team was something that the NHS England um, commissioned and, and put in place. And they, look, they started by looking specifically at the patients who had been inpatients at Winterbourne View. They are long... Uh, detailed reviews and have and the feedback from those has been very positive. Um, the Winterbourne View two year on report that we're publishing today includes um, a quote from um, a, a mum of, a, of somebody who's got some significant needs who is the, um, the chair of the National Valuing Families Forum, Vicky Raphael, who's been part of some of those care and treatment reviews and, and and the, and the really strong message is that by involving people who are experts by experience, actually enabling them to not only understand what some of the difficulties and blockages have been, but also being able to contribute and challenge um, has been significant. And we've learned a lot from, from doing that and using um, and having experts by experience sitting alongside us. So in terms of getting the right care in the right place, um, we will continue to, to look at, at supporting discharge and the care and treatment reviews that I talked about at a previous board meeting um, have continued apace. So we have now done, by the middle of January, just over a thousand. So we've done a thousand and thirty-two care and treatment reviews. These are people that are in non-secure or low-secure um, inpatient settings. We will, by the beginning of March, have done over, over 1,300. Uh, they are acting as a real lever in understanding what some of the challenges are and really pushing um, some of those discharges. And by the middle of, of January, we've also discharged 566 people that were inpatients as at April. Um, that information is based on our own internal management data. <coughs> I think I'd be the first to say, and many families and people with learning disability would agree, this is not enough, and we need to move. We need to move further and faster. But we do know that it's that it's um, that it's an effective lever, and we are doing. An, we've commissioned a review of those CTRs so we can learn from them. And as part of our response to Stephen Bubb, we'll be um, evaluating that those reviews and um, setting out what lessons we can learn and what improvements we can make. We're also taking the CTR process one step further. Um, many people will know that the, as fast as we discharge, people are being admitted, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So one of the very key parts of the response to Stephen Bubb is how do we prevent inappropriate admissions? So we intend to take those, um, commission, those CTRs into the admissions and process. So there are a couple of key actions we're going to take. The first one is to work with CCGs and local authorities to establish a register of people that are at risk of admission. So identifying people that we feel may, be, may need to be admitted and to try and preempt that by putting support and services into the community to, to stop that happening. But if a request for an admission is made, to put in a, in a gateway almost where people are um, reviewed and assessed and the need for admission is challenged, and services put in place. 
I'm under no illusion in the, in the, in the immediate future we will probably still need to have some people that are admitted because those services won't be in place. But the important part will be that we'll start to, um, start to highlight and really track anybody that is admitted. If they're admitted, we are saying we expect there to be an immediate discharge plan, that this is short term, that it's clear what they're being admitted for and what, and what we need to do to get people um, discharged. And that, the information from that, from that challenge process will help us as we determine um, the longer term care model. In terms of reshaping services, uh, the document that we're publishing talks about the development of a much more detailed service model. We're working with people uh, with learning disability, carers, clinicians, providers, all the different sectors to develop that model. We're expecting to do that by June. Um, and that will confirm what outcomes we want to achieve, what kind of services should be in place. That will include inpatient, type, inpatient capacity as well as community-based support and the standards that we expect those services um, to meet. And we're doing that um, based on feedback and, and commentary and support that has been requested from commissioners. People have said they really want to see something that is more detailed, that they can use, that will help them to commission the right, the right services. The model will have a strong emphasis on personalised care, um, personal budgets, personal health budgets. It will be focused very much on an expectation that care should be provided in the community and admission is a last resort um, and only for, only for very, specific, very specific needs. And we know that the work around the integrated personal commissioning programme um, that's been referred to both in the papers <coughs> elsewhere um, will also include in some of the areas that are going to, um, to pilot that uh, for that are going to concentrate on people with learning disability. We intend to implement that, that new service model in two ways. Every single part of the country will get some local support, but we, we want to reshape services at pace in the north of England. The papers um, that you've got um, today will really highlight some of the challenges being faced by the north of England. So the north of England, when we look at the quarter two data from 14-15, um, um, we can see that as at the end of September, the number of patients, number of inpatients was <coughs> highest in the north as opposed to anywhere else. So for example, it was 1,008 in the north versus 286 in the London region. Um, the number of admissions is the highest out of all of the at rest of the country. The numbers of people without a planned discharge date was the highest, and the, two, the 2013 census showed that the prevalence of admission per thousand population is also at the highest. So there are some real issues in the north that we really want to help them um, implement this service model at, at pace, and we will put in place a task force to, um, to help them do that and some concentrated support and effort to do it. Families, any families that are listening, any other um, interested parties that are listening may well be concerned, what about the rest of the country? And I just want to reiterate that we are continuing to support the rest of the country as well. We're not expecting <coughs> you know, the rest of the country to stop, to stop and not do anything. We're expecting um, action to be taken and, and uh, best practice and we, what we know works to be implemented. We will, as we... Um, we will use the levers that we've got, so we'll use the standard contract. We've already got um, new, um, new, bit, new um, expectations set in the 1516 standard contract. Um, we will also work um, throughout 1516 to look at whether we can, we will consult and look at whether we can put financial levers into contracts and, um, from next, from the following year. We're also going to look very specifically at um, supporting commissioners to work together. We know that the best way of caring for people with learning disability is for local authorities, um, NHS commissioners, both CCG and specialised, to really work together to um, pool budgets, to look at what the needs are and to wrap those services around individuals. Um, so from April we're inviting CCGs to work much more closely with local authorities, to commission <coughs> together and we're going to uh, support accelerated delivery in the north by offering people the opportunity to um, co-commission from specialised and CCG commissioning and we think that will identify quite a few areas of that we, where we can really demonstrate um, um, progress. I'll just mention briefly two other areas. This is not NHS England's uh, responsibility but it's worth flagging. The first one is that CQC will um, have, have agreed to ramp up some of their um, regulation and inspection 
of organisations that include mental health, learning disability, acute as well as community settings. Um, they will look at inappropriate models of care. They'll work with NHS England around what they what they see, how what care is um, commissioned, and we, through our care and treatment reviews, will work with C with CQC identifying any concerns that we that we find. And we've already had we've already been doing that in the over the last few weeks. Um, and then, last but not least, Health Education England are supporting are doing significant, and they're going to lead on improving uh, the workforce and they're going to work with skills for care and skills for health to do that. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of specific areas. The BUB report uh, mentioned uh, looking at um, some sort of academy concentrating very much on positive behaviour support which we know can, can impact on the way in which people with challenging behaviour are managed and dealt with so it's not about using drugs it's about using other other methods for, for supporting that. So one of the specific pieces of work that HE are going to do is to develop, develop that personalised support, treatment approaches using holistic assessments and using non-impact non assessments and treatments using positive approaches. And they are very clear that if we're going to do this right, it has to be done with social care sector, the private sector and the voluntary sector, because all of those organisations, all of those um, providers actually actually care for people with learning disability. This is not just about the NHS and I think the support from Skills for Health and Skills for Care has been very um, positive about that. And uh, next month there is a, a, a big um, event which HEE are leading which actually starts to bring together all of those experts in the field. They're going to use a system which they've implemented around dementia, so a three tiered strategy which concentrates on awareness raising for you know, a, a high volume of people to then looking at um, incorporating more detailed learning and then finally developing experts and real leaders in the field and using a, a various different means of methods so they could use e-learning, face-to-face um, -face tuition etc. So I've gone through that reasonably quickly. Um, the report is, is, on the, is on our website from today. The Winterbourne View Two Year On report is on the websites from today. Um, that includes, the Winterbourne View Two Year On report inv includes quite a lot of patient stories and case histories about things that have worked, things that haven't. Um, and I just, I've been very happy to take questions just to, com just to, com just to reinforce that uh, this is something that we in NHS England are deeply committed to um, improving and making a big difference and that that commitment is supported by all of the organisations I've referred to which is why we have a cross-system response today. Thank Jane, you. Thank you very much for that. I mean, there's a lot for us to digest and yeah. it was um, necessary, <coughs> necessary to have that comprehensive coverage because we got the paper, the, the joint paper, uh, relatively late and so we've not all of us had a chance to read it in detail so uh, thank you for that explanation. Uh, let me invite uh, comments. I have John Byrne and Margaret. Jane, um, three questions. Um, drill into the uh, iceberg. <coughs> the first one you've already addressed a little bit, just to be clear, why why do you think there is such a, uh, a disparity between the North and the South in terms of hospital uh, occupancy and whether that reflects quality of care or other factors? answer that one first because that's the simplest question I want to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, good. Um, there, what we do know is that there is, a, there, is, we, there is a supply led demand. We know that the number of beds in the north is significantly higher than the south of the country, you know, the south of London. Um, and actually when you look at the date, the, look at the information, you can then, the Midlands and East is the second highest and actually they've got quite a lot of beds as well. Mm. So. Um, our expectation is, or our belief is, that most of that is supply-led. Sort of easier well, to leave. There's a bed. Yeah. It's easier to yeah. um, to admit. So is that there is there. That's probably okay. Key, so isn't? that's really just sort of the supply issue rather than a sort of necessarily different, different quality of care. The second question is, the number of people involved here is a small number of thousands, mm -hmm. but the number of people with significant learning disabilities, especially if you wrap in autistic spectrum disorders, yeah. runs into the many hundreds of thousands, or, or certainly many tens of thousands. So there's obviously an iceberg effect there that pe people perhaps aren't in any kind of care. They're just you know, un being cared for by their families or whatever. And yeah. to what extent are we going to drill down to try and pull them into the system? Um, you're absolutely right. Um, there, this is this is really the tip of the iceberg. So some of our figures show 2,600. 
the census data, which is a provider-led information, is, is used just over 3,000. That does include people that are commissioned by local authority, not just NHS. Um, our, our best guess is that there's probably about 24,000 people out there that could possibly be um, at risk of admission. And, you know, as you said, there are you know, over, I think, up to 2 million people with <coughs> some form of learning disability. So there, is, there, is, there are a lot. And the vast majority um, of supporting care is provided either in people's own homes um, or supported um, by, by local authorities in particular. Um, as part of what we're doing, um, we, one of the reasons why it's so important that we do this together is actually that we work alongside local authorities so we have a much better understanding of the whole cohort. And the CARE Act um, also put in place um, proper um, assessments and plans for children, so children with special educational needs. That starts from April, so that means that for children, and children are a vital part of this, um, people should have com an assessment which includes local authority, education and health, and a plan. So as we move forward, we will be much more aware of the needs of children, and as, we, as children then grow and transition into adulthood, we should have a much better understanding of what, what those needs are, and I would expect us to, um, to be implementing some of the thing we're doing now much earlier on so we can stop people being admitted and stop them needing to be admitted. My third point, I might just make a comment because it's actually out with the remit of this item, but I mean the point that James made that there are probably two million people out there with significant learning disabilities, functional illiteracy and so on. I think we, the whole system needs to be conscious of the challenge of someone with functional illiteracy turning up in hospital <coughs> and being given consent forms that they can't understand and so on. So I think this is a whole system issue, although this is a very important tip of the iceberg. I can I mean, just really briefly. Um, there, um, there is, there's been, there is quite a lot of work that's going on around um, making, um, making exceptions and, and supporting people that actually go into, for example, acute hospitals. And uh, the uh, mid, the east of England have done a significant amount of, of work on that called reasonable adjustments, and that is about looking at what people might need and doing things, for example, like making sure that you've got somebody that can use Makaton or can converse with somebody that you may put appointments at the beginning of a day rather than at the end of the day that. Um, you're very conscious that um, you know noise, sound, um, unusual circumstances can have a massive impact on on people on, on somebody's behaviour, particularly um, if they if that's quite distressing. So there's there is quite a lot of work that we've done, um, but I wouldn't underestimate that that there is a lot more that we can do. Thank you. Uh, first of all, um, Jane, I have to say that I'm really pleased that the the width of of, of um, the program and, and the way it's moved on and um, uh, the detail that's gone into um, the, the work is, is really um, praiseworthy. Um, you touched on um, ch children and adolescents and, and I'm, I'm glad that you did because my, my first question was going to be about the lead organisations and why it is that there isn't a lead organisation that focuses on, on, on children and adolescents um, because to me that it's a really important part of the whole package. Um, my, my next question, um, to a large extent, has been um, raised by by John, and that is really to do with the pressures that that, that um, are imposed on um, the social side by the tip of the iceberg concept, and 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 therefore the I, I suppose that the correlative pressure that that will put on. Um, pushing people back into the let's keep them in um, philosophy because we haven't actually got the package sorted yet and how in a few years time we're not going to find ourselves again in a situation in which Steve and Bob has to come and carry out another review um, and um, I, I suppose to a large extent um, whether the workforce um, aspect of that um, that the model um, is to be augmented by um, the third sector um, and if so um, and again you've touched on this um, the extent to which HEE will embrace what's required to bring on the third sector to get the third sector to, you know, to, 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 to support um, the social services because there's so much um, 
part in that army of, of, of support. Um, okay, so in terms of your point about lead organisation for children and young people, um, it's I think it's a vital part of everybody. So it's I don't think we could to do that, but I, my my feeling is that it should be an integrated part of everything we do. So rather than it making it just one person's business and others not having that interest. So for us, in, as commissioners, it's really important. For the department, in terms of some of their policy lead, it's really important. For local authorities, it's critical. Um, so I think together we, we, can, uh, we, can, we can actually make um, quite a difference. And the key for me is actually starting early. And we know from some of the um, organisations like the Families Forum, like Challenging Behaviour Foundation, um, children and young people and, su and supporting them early is an absolutely vital part of their, uh, of, of their sort of, um, I wouldn't say their remit exactly, but their concerns. And they, you know, they work with us, they ask us the questions about that all of the time. So we, nobody's going nobody, nobody's to let us forget it and we won't forget it ourselves. In terms of future proofing, I, I think um, the point you make is well made. We have had problems and a lack of action for years um, and years. Um, and so one of the reasons why we are so committed to making sure that we don't end up in three, five years' time in the same position is that we are concentrating very much on um, <coughs> giving people with lone disability and their families the sort of rights and, and, and power to talk about what they want this actually giving so it's not about being done to it's not about us deciding what happens to them it's about individuals being able to say what they want and us responding um, the whole shift to being very <coughs> much more openness and transparency and, and being very clear about the position we're in what we're doing reporting on information reporting on admissions reporting on discharges I think gives that focus concentrating very much on avoiding admission will help and as we as we start to reduce the number of people that are in inpatient beds and we build facilities in the community my expectation is that actually we start to make this business as usual and it becomes normal practice for people to be stay and supported in the community setting and it will be an exception for admission um, and in terms of the workforce um, uh, you're absolutely right one of the reasons one of the things that happened with the uh, Stephen Bubb group was that included quite a lot of um, both independent and voluntary sector organisations and there is a significant amount of expertise around um, working with and supporting people with learning disability that is in the voluntary sector um, or in, in various different and it would be naive and probably arrogant to assume that the only people that can do that is the NHS and so we, we need to work together with local authorities and the voluntary sector and other organisations to make this happen. It wasn't the point I was going to make. But Skills for Care is an organisation which works for, uh, um, is interested in the development of the workforce in social care, 1.1 million of whom are in the private and voluntary sector and a much smaller proportion are in um, uh, in local government. But um, th that's just for clarification. In fact, Margaret did ask my question, which was about <laughs> where are directors of children's services. I think um, uh, it, it's, it's fine to say that... Uh, um, Everyone, everyone is concerned with children, but actually some um, explicit commitment, because I think there's only one mention really in relation to looked after children and um, uh, the education of, uh, aspects of it. But there is a whole, uh, as, you know, what much wider um, concerns really around children. And I think we should, it should be made more explicit about how that is uh, is being um, uh, owned, as it were. Um, uh, for, for um, ongoingly as well as immediately. Um, but I did just want to ask the question really about our governance of this. Um, it has been, it is encouraging to see the progress, but if I was a, um, a family member of someone with a learning disability, I would be saying, yeah, but you know, how long has it taken you to get there? Um, so what, what will we do? What will this board do to oversee that pace of change that you're trying to increase? Um, now, Jane. Okay. Um, uh, yes, I agree, Maura. I think um, if I, you know, and I've spoken to lots of families, and the comments that you've just made, I've, I've had. Um, <laughs> they rec and many of them recognise that there's been some significant change in and movement, but it, 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 you know, it's still, we still have a long way to go. Mm. 
Um, in terms of the internal governance, we have our own um, internal programme board. Um, Karen and I have been uh, discussing, debating how, how we can strengthen that. Um, we've had uh, further conversations with one of our regional directors around um, how, we can, how we can make that better. We've got a very clear internal governance system already and we're looking to see how we can enhance that. I'm, I'm also very clear that I am accountable to um, you know, both Simon and this board for the delivery of what um, NHS England needs to contribute to this programme and <coughs> I'm very happy to make sure that that is fed back on a regular basis and will give you as many updates as you like. Um, the other thing I just wondered, and it just see what Chen thinks, is whether or not it would be sensible for me to either, to it at a board meeting or at, or separately, actually provide an update in a bit more detail about the children and young people idea, so that I can give you some information about how we're going to tackle that and what we're going to do. Would that be, would that be useful? So I can I can do that. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about that? Okay. Thank you very much, Jane. I think we share your disappointment about the the, the slowness of progress. Mm -hmm. Uh, the task has proved, I think, much more daunting um, than was originally conceived. But um, I, for one, I'm sure the board would welcome uh, the suggestion that you give us further briefing, uh, both on the, on the broader children and young people's issues which have arisen today, but also specifically on, uh, on the transforming care agenda. So uh, we'd like to, I think, follow that as closely as we can. Good. Uh, thank you very much.